Good morning, and welcome to the virtual worship service for the Fredonia Presbyterian Church. We are so glad you chose to join us, and we want you to know that whoever you are, wherever you are, we're happy that you're with us. We are an open and affirming service-oriented church where everyone is welcomed and affirmed. Our congregation is currently in a time of transition after the retirement of our longtime minister. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Spangler, our current clerk of session, one of many people charged with helping the church as we search for our next minister. And many hands make light work. The work does continue. The PNC and the session both met this week. The food pantry was open for curbside pickup yesterday, and our Equal Exchange Ministry has returned to the farmer's market on the first and third Saturdays of each month. We are still following social distancing guidelines, but hygiene kits will be collected in August, so stay tuned for more details on that. We are also very excited to announce that we have begun the process of securing music streaming licenses for some of the songs we use regularly in our worship. Up until this point, we haven't been able to use any music legally online, but as you will see in today's service, we're making some progress on that front, and in the weeks ahead, we hope to add to our available repertoire. And now, I hope you will join me in our opening sentences. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Please join me in a short moment of silence. Please read with me our call to worship. God cares for us completely and calls for our total commitment. Christ gave his life that we might live and calls us to give our lives to him. Let us welcome God to this moment and place and join in worship. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and loving, will forgive us. Friends, let us confess our sins, first in a silent prayer and then in a unison prayer. God of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, God of Hagar and Ishmael, who gave us your Son, Jesus Christ, the crucified, send your Holy Spirit to help us confess and truly repent of our sins. We turn against one another. We fail to care for the weak and the poor among us. We pay no heed to the cries of the powerless. We seek our own advantage. Your son emptied himself upon a Roman cross and revealed your eternal, self-giving love. Forgive us, merciful God. Wipe sin from our lives and let us find ourselves holy in Jesus Christ, our Savior. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. Listen for the word of God. Lord, you enticed me, and I was taken in. You were too strong for me, and you prevailed. 
Now I'm laughed at all the time. Everyone mocks me. Every time I open my mouth, I cry out and say, violence and destruction. The Lord's word has brought me nothing but insult and injury, constantly. I thought, I'll forget him. I'll no longer speak in his name. But there's an intense fire in my heart, trapped in my bones. I'm drained trying to contain it. I'm unable to do it. I hear many whisperings. Panic lurks everywhere. Proclaim, yes, let's proclaim it ourselves. All my friends are waiting for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed. Then we'll prevail against him and get our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a strong defender. Therefore, my oppressors will stumble and not prevail. They will be disgraced by their own failures. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. The Lord of heavenly forces tests the righteous and discerns the heart and mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for I have committed my case to you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has rescued the needy from the clutches of evildoers. The New Testament reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Listen for the word of God. Now when the human one comes in his majesty and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him. He will separate them from each other, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, but the goats he will put on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from the Father. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Then he will go to those on his left. Get away from me, you who will receive terrible things. Go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and didn't do anything to help you? Then he will answer, I assure you that when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous ones will go into eternal life. Thus ends the reading. Thanks be to God. So, this is the first time I have ever preached off lectionary, and it feels a little odd. But I'm doing so today on the guidance of the official Presbyterian Mission Organization from the PCUSA. For those of you who, like me, didn't grow up Presbyterian, you might be interested to know our congregation is part of a regional group of churches called the Presbytery of Western New York. Our Presbytery is part of a larger group called the Synod of the Northeast, and all of the synods belong to the General Assembly of the PCUSA. Now, several people in our church could give you a much more detailed explanation of how the PCUSA functions, but today I wanted to focus on the fact that we belong to a much larger fellowship than we often see, and I am particularly glad to have that larger community in times like these. 
We are living in an unprecedented global pandemic and a national moment of reckoning around race. And we are doing it all without a full-time pastor. Friends, this is a lot to grapple with. But none of us have to do it alone. In the last few months, we have had wonderful sermons from an array of guest preachers about the way our community has stepped up for each other, the way Jesus modeled his ministry for us to follow, the way the Holy Spirit is available and accessible to each of us, and how we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that come before us and show us the way. Today, I wanted to talk about some more tangible resources we have available to guide us through these turbulent times. The first and most visible has been Reverend Ron Sumption, a retired minister from Westfield who came to us via the recommendation of the Presbytery and who has helped us so generously with both preaching and pastoral care. Mark Armesto from the Presbytery Committee on Ministry continues to meet with us diligently on the pastor nominating committee. Reverend Rachel Brown of Hamburg Presbyterian has graciously been moderating our session meetings online as we would not be authorized to meet without her. We continually get up-to-date policy and procedure outlines from the Presbytery on the COVID-19 crisis. As one of the people tasked with helping to lead the church right now, I am so grateful for the support and guidance. I had even started to think that we might just have this pandemic thing all figured out. Then, like most Americans, I sat in horror as I watched the brutal murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers. I heard him cry out for his mother. I watched him die and something inside of me broke and it broke again and again and again as I read similar stories of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, David McAtee, and so many others. I felt a stirring of hope as good people took to the streets, and then I felt that hope shatter as their grief and righteous anger was met with rubber bullets, agitators, and white supremacists. I felt outrage as tear gas was used against peaceful protesters in our nation's capital, despite the fact that they had broken no laws. I felt helpless and lost and frightened because despite my deep desire to see meaningful change, I feared there was little that I could do to be part of that process on my own. Then I turned to our National Presbyterian Church for guidance. On their website, I found resources, reading lists, and videos on race and faith. I also found some wonderful sermons and letters written by people of color within the church who are grappling with the same things I was. We have an amazing stated clerk of, session of the PCUSA, the Reverend Dr. J. Herbert Nelson, who spoke directly to churches like ours asking us to learn to be uncomfortable. He wrote, no longer can we hide behind not being controversial. We are all in the quagmire now. He challenged churches to be present, even when we don't have all the answers, to sit and to listen. And he suggested that doing so might lead to transformation, not just in the people we meet, but also in ourselves and in our churches. The PCUSA also led me to their mission page, where I found a piece on Matthew 25 churches. Now, I had never heard that term before, but as you might guess, it comes from our New Testament reading today, where God separates the goats, those who are being cast out, from the sheep who God is bringing in close. In this story, God, or the king, says, Come, you 
who are blessed. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you look after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The people ask when they did those things, and they are told, Truly I tell you, whenever you did one of these for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then the king goes on to say the same thing, but for the goats, saying that they did not feed or clothe or visit or offer drink or take care of the king when he was sick. And as they're being cast out, they ask when they failed to do such thing for a king. But the king explains, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Matthew 25 ultimately offers us a more authentic, a more biblical, a more Christian model for our mission work. Not proselytizing, but being present. Not condemnation, but care. Not haughty, but humble. You see, for too many years, and for years I mean centuries, the mission model of the church at large was steeped deeply in a foundation of white supremacy. The idea that white middle class and mostly male Christians had all the right answers and were called to go out into the world to convert people to our ways by force if necessary. We use the idea of divine rights or God on our side to subjugate native peoples all over the world. The church started wars and helped trigger genocides. In America, the Christian faith was used to justify slaughtering Native Americans and stealing their land. The Bible was used to prop up slavery, segregation, and even lynching. Church doctrine was used to keep women subordinate and to fuel hate against queer people all the while making the church itself richer and more powerful in the process. Through the Matthew 25 mission, the Presbyterian Church is seeking to radically reform the way we think about and act on our mission work. It calls for Presbyterians to turn away from notions of white supremacy, to let go of the belief that we have all the answers, or that even there is a single right answer in complex situations. Matthew 25 churches are called to stop trying to drag people into the church and save them from themselves or change them to better fit with our ideas of how they should live. Matthew 25 churches are called to set aside judgment and meet people in the streets, in their homes, in their neighborhoods. We are not called to condemn their hurt, their anger, their suspicion of us, but rather to sit and listen, to offer a cold drink, a warm coat, a shoulder to lean on. Friends, it is time for us to become a Matthew 25 church. The first step in that process is to declare ourselves a Matthew 25 church something our session will discuss in the coming weeks. But it is not something the session can do alone. It will take a commitment from each and every one of us, the commitment to being uncomfortable, the commitment to admitting we have made mistakes and striving to learn better so we can do better. It is time for us to abandon our fear of being controversial and settle into this quagmire. As our own Jeff McMinn told us in a recent meeting of the PNC, we are all uncomfortable right now. There is no getting around it. No matter what side of an issue you're on or what politics you hold, everyone is uncomfortable. And 
it's time to stop trying to fight that and commit to being present in the struggle. It is time for us to let go of our very human impulse to tell people what we know and instead listen to the voices of the poor, the sick, the hurting, and the oppressed. We need to seek out the voices of people of color, trans folks, immigrants, queer people, and people with disabilities. To that end, the session has already committed to sharing more diverse resources on social media in order to lift up, lift up the lived experiences of minorities. We are also arranging some guest speakers and planning to share more sermons that focus on issues around faith and race, faith and orientation, faith and gender identity, as well as discussing the responsibility of less diverse churches to do work around anti-racism and privilege. I hope you will get excited about this work. I hope you will welcome the challenge. I hope you are stirred by the voices of our brothers and sisters because I believe they have so much to teach us if only we are willing to let them. So in that vein, I would like to now turn to the PCUSA's Mission President and Executive Director, Diane Moffitt. She wrote a statement on the recent protests and shootings, and we have shared it in its entirety on our Facebook page. I highly suggest you read it. But in the meantime, I'm going to close by sharing an excerpt of her words. She writes, My soul is troubled. With the COVID-19 pandemic raging, killing over 106,000 people in this country and disproportionately impacting communities of color, and with the slayings of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and just this week, David McAtee, my cup runneth over with despair. These kinds of heinous killings are the fruit of institutional racism. Institutional racism extends beyond one's personal attitude and behavior toward black people and people of color. Structural racism is steeped in a narrative of white supremacy. It is baked into the institution of this country from the inception of the nation. Native Americans were unjustly treated by European settlers who killed them with guns and disease they brought to this country. The truth is that the land that was so-called discovered by Columbus belongs to Native Americans, and it was stolen from them. It was the belief in their superiority that gave them rationale to the actions of European settlers. The Presbyterian Church USA repudiated the doctrine of discovery and its racist tenets at the 2016 General Assembly. The Presbyterian Mission Agency continues to advocate for dismantling of structural racism. It is one of the three foci of the Matthew 25 vision. Matthew 25 calls us to seize the moment and reveals God's blessings upon nations that respond with compassion and justice toward those who need the material goods that lead to the fullness of life and human dignity. I am concerned about our nation and our world. Considering what we are witnessing in response to the killing of George Floyd and others, it is important that the church acts. While I do not condone the violence, I am aware that you cannot keep kicking people, blame them for limping, and expect them to remain calm. Martin Luther King Jr. said, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the promise of freedom and justice have not been met. Amen. Please join with me in our affirmation of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. 
in gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, please bow your head and join with me in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, you have loved us deeply and asked only for us to love you and each other in return. Please forgive us when we have let our own egos prevent us from being fully present for those in need. Forgive us for times when we have let differences divide us from those who cry out in anguish. Please forgive us for times when we have aligned ourselves with the proud and the powerful instead of seeking to ease the burdens of those in greatest need. Please help us to turn away from the ways of a world built on self-centered ideologies and turn evermore toward you. Lord, be with all of those in our own community and in the world at large who are fighting for justice and change. Please be with our leaders. Help them to be open-minded and open-hearted as people strive to dismantle old systems of oppression and rebuild in ways that serve all people fairly. God of love and mercy, even as we turn our hopes and dreams toward a better future, we also know that right here and right now still offers tremendous challenges. The global pandemic has not ended, and in most places around our nation, it is still on the rise. Lord, we have no frame of reference for 2 million people sick and 120,000 people dead. It is so hard for us to process a crisis of this magnitude. Please help us to know how to grieve, how to care for the sick and isolated, how to stay strong and our ongoing commitment to do whatever we can to keep our community safe, even when it is inconvenient or hard. We also pray for those whose struggles go unseen more than ever these days. For those living in poverty, those facing abuse in places that may look like safe havens from the outside. We pray for the immigrant and the refugee whose plight must never be forgotten, no matter what other news fills our headlines. We pray too that you never let us forget the hungry, the sad, the suffering, even in our own times of trouble. We know that each of us bears a responsibility to our neighbors, now more than ever. And we ask you to show us new ways to serve others in this socially distant world. Gracious God, we ask these things to help bring us closer to you and closer to our neighbors. Which is why we also pray for those in need in our own congregation. Lori Fabritis, Richard Staborski. Rena Finko, Janet Gerkensmeyer, Greg Furman, Greg Muller, Gina Waite Platt, Donna Heintzman, Dick Ackley, Josiah Robinette, Tim Brackett, Rachel H., Michelle Patterson, Hazel Crockless, Kim Rizko, Zachary Delaniak, Travis Kloss, May Lai, Amy Calm, Milo Willie, Dick Watt, Caleb Koss, Joy Height, the Reverend Early Waller, Judy Sumption, Charles Devine, Lorraine Withington, and Tom Withington. You are a God of compassion and mercy. Please forgive us for the ways we have fallen short for times when we have let our worst impulses pull us away from you. Instill in us a renewed faith, 
a fire for justice, a true passion for service, and hearts full of compassion. Loving Creator, we pray these prayers in full assurance that you have already heard them, both because we have seen your work in our lives and because it was your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the point in the service where we normally take up a collection of tithes and tokens as a reminder that all that we have comes from God. If you are able and feel called to do so, you can absolutely send those into the church. I assure you they will be appreciated and they will be put to good use. However, if you are not in a position to do so for any reason, please know that we understand and we believe that God does too. So please take a moment to reflect on what being a faithful steward of God's gift means to you in this time. please join with me in our unison prayer of thanks. God of wondrous love, you have touched us and never left us in despair. You have held us in our grief and chaos. You have never deserted us. You paid us a visit and your visit has never ended. You clung to us when we were given up for dead. In life and in death, you raise us anew. This we know, this we experience, this is your word of assurance. God of wondrous love, touch us again in this time. Stay with us as we continue healing our memories and our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, repaying no one evil for evil but do good to one another. Rejoice always. Pray constantly and find reason to give thanks in all circumstances. May God the Creator watch over you. May Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior walk by your side and show you the way. And may the Holy Spirit dwell in your heart and bring you peace. Now, our final words of response can be sung by those of you at home. And I hope you will. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere. You may.